Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Fun Friend Friday. Yes, it is Success Coaching Live, and it is a Fun Friend Friday. And so take a moment, jump in, and as you jump in, do me a favor and start to share this out. Um, we're going to be joined by my good friend Dennis LaRue here in just a minute. So I will give everybody a chance to jump in the room, get logged in, get started as we begin Fun Friend Friday. You know, Fun Friend Friday is turning out to be just like the best day of the week. Good morning, Clyde. Hope you are having a good day. Go ahead and share this out. We're going to be starting Fun Friend Friday in just a minute. Good morning, Michelle. Yes. So nice to be back in the warm. Um, good morning, Aunt Deb. Good evening, Aunt Deb. Good morning, Dennis. Yes, I will be bringing you on in just a minute. So stand right there. I see Dennis has popped in. He is going to be our guest today. I tell you, I am loving Fun Friend Friday. It is like, I, I well, I get to hang out with some cool people, you guys and the special guests, so that makes it cool. I've learned so much from other people, and what I think is really exciting about Fun Friend Friday is it's not planned, it's not organized, well, <laughs> organized to the point that I, I know who's coming, but we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know what we're going to be doing, you know, it's sort of for me, I, I walk into the space and I want to see what can be created between two people. We share some common beliefs and kind of common thinking, but I don't want it so over scripted that you guys feel like you're watching, you know, something calculated. It, it becomes a through me to you for me kind of thing. And so let me just get rid of that little message. And so it's so much fun because we've had so many great conversations with so many cool people that happens spontaneous. I'm still thinking back on Amy's thing about, you know, just finding the joy and finding the happiness in the moment. And then with um, Gail and the idea of organ transplant, and Gail, I actually shared part of that story with somebody last week about how it's such a spontaneous event. Nobody really plans to be that organ donor that morning when it happens and what that impact is on their family and Dr. Holly Kelly and um, Diane. I was thinking of your fun friend Friday when was traveling through the airports and how you said you can leave a legacy just with a smile and a kind word. And so I made it really intentional, like everybody I bumped into at that airport, because that was where your story had started. I made real serious com you know, eye connection and I thanked them. And if they had a name badge on, I, I thanked them by name if I could. Um, and I thought of that lesson you had taught on Fun Friend Friday about legacy and how we go through life with moments of opportunity. And then I think about Becky's Fun Friend Friday where she shared the idea of divine appointments. That one, that one was big. If you missed it, you need to go find it. I need to compile them all into a, a group um, where we fill our appointment book so full with what we need to do and what we want and all focused on us that we don't leave room for divine appointments to appear. So I gotta tell you, Fun Friend Friday rocks. <laughs> so before we get started, do me a real quick favor, share this out so everybody in your social media gets to meet my friend, Dennis LaRue, and then you'll get to share in the Fun Friend Friday and your funds will get to share in the Fun Friend Friday group. Yes, Gail, I, I keep thinking I gotta get honorary badges that Fun Friend Friday warriors can, can wear. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and invite Dennis here in just a minute. Let me just get set up because we do have our Fun Friend Friday theme music. See how good I'm getting at Fun Friend Friday? I've got to find a friend to invite. Um, hey, Ryan. I hope the cars are getting faster and faster. I saw that you are like totally dedicated and diving into that dream. I am so proud of you for, for pursuing that. Um, my friend Ryan Hagar, um has taken the idea of mini cars and he is working on leadership and developing young boys through working on mini cars and mini car racing and the whole sport that it is as sort of a mentorship tool and leadership development tool in a way of him giving back to his community. And I, I think it's really cool. And when I say mini cars, I'm not talking the mini Cooper cars. I'm talking like little cars the size of, you know, like car, chairs, dinner chairs. So 
Um, really fun. Go check him out. He's got a fun page. I'm going to go ahead and try and invite Dennis. So let me just see if I can do that. Um, boom. So he should be jumping in and it's adding, it's adding, it's adding. Don't mention that Facebook. And boom, there he is, live and in there color. We go. What's going on, Eric? Not much, but we have to do our music. I forgot to cue the music. Thank you for being a friend. Great song. <laughs> Back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. Who would have thought this 80s classic would come back to haunt you? <laughs> and I know everybody that grew up during this is like seeing all of the, you know, Betty White and all of them at the kitchen table eating the cheesecake and, you know, going out on the lanai and all that. So um, I know, yes, I was addicted for a while. I think it was the Blanche Devereaux character because I hadn't grown up in the South at the time. So thank you for being a friend today. Oh, I'm my pleasure. Join us. Oh, I'm excited to be here, really. And that song reminds me uh, of what you described. But also, I had a friend in college. Her name is Beth, and she loved this music. And, you know, back in that day, we didn't have uh, – a lot of ways to record music. There wasn't Spotify, Pandora, <laughs> iTunes. I mean, and a f this person made a tape for me and that song was on that tape. She was one of my good friends in college. So <laughs> it, that, that reminded me of her immediately when it came up. So do you, re oh, that brings up such a memory. You remember those mixed tapes we used to make for people? I, I can remember not getting any sleep at night because I would leave my tape recorder at the foot of my bed next to the radio I took from my dad's garage. And when I would hear a song on the radio, I would jump up and hit play record at the same time so I could get that song. See, now I love this because you young folk, you young folk don't remember that you had to mash the two buttons simultaneously or it wouldn't click in. And if you didn't have the cassette in the little deck just right, it would like, you'd mash and it would pop back out. And you jumble and then, or you'd be dating somebody and they'd be like, I made you a mixtape. And you'd be like, oh Lord, I hope it's the happy songs, not the breakup song mixtape. Yeah. Things are getting serious when you made the mixtape. So, so that sort of diverges us down a little road for a minute. So if you were going to make a mixtape today, what three songs would have to be on it? What three songs would have to be on it? Wow, that's a great question there, coach. Um, my go-to songs back in that day would have been Brian Adams' Heaven. Um, Chicago, just about anything by Chicago back then in the 80s would have worked. And, um, there was a song that I really liked. It was a band called The Pixies. And the name of the song was La La Love You. It was a really weird song. And it was real short, and that's all they said the whole time. All they said was, all I'm saying, pretty baby, is I la la love you, and I don't mean maybe. That's all they sang the whole song. But I, that was one I yeah, the, We all had the, the 80s were filled with those one-hit wonders. I think it sort of speaks to the generation that we couldn't, like, lock into anything for too long. That it lasted, like, one hit, and then you were out. Um, my sister was a big Chicago fan, so I had to go the complete opposite direction because, you know, little brothers can't follow big sisters. So she was the BTO, the Chicago, and that, you know, whole kind of thing. So I had to go completely Motown. Nothing in common with my goal with my sister. So all of my mixtapes would have had to have some kind of Motown, Detroit kind of sound to it. And I'm a white kid growing up in Toledo, Ohio. So, you know, I, I, I didn't get a lot of mixtapes. Um, <laughs> and so, the funny thing about mixtapes, real quick, is when you do press that play and everything, anything going on in the background ends up on the tape. I still to this day can hear songs from the 80s and hear my dog backing in the back, barking <laughs> in the background. 
some weird noise that popped up right at that moment. That's just one of those things. But then anyway. you remember, you remember when everything went wrong and you had to take the pencil and like trying to rewind the tape and you would pull it out and try and smooth it and then rewind it and smooth it just because you were trying to preserve that classic tape. See, your yeah. kids nowadays, you got it easy. You just like hit iTunes and you got everything you want. Back in the day, when it was cold and we had to walk uphill to go to school and carry our mixtapes in our backpack and they get all crinkly to fix it ourselves. You know, <laughs> that's what built character. That's what built mixtapes and, and CDs and 80 tracks. And I never quite had to do the big Blu rays. That went through really fast. Well, we, to let everybody know, we kind of spent time together in Paraguay. You were in Paraguay with the John Maxwell team, yes? I was the first trip I was there. Absolutely. Oh my, what a what a life changing moment. I was gonna ask when you arrived, so at that point I had already been in South America, so I kind of had been tempered into South America and understanding our the South America, Paraguay, Uruguay culture. What was the like first impression stepping off the plane? First impression stepping off the plane. Well, it was really dark and humid. Now, I'm retired Air Force, so oh. I actually spent um, I, my very first deployment in the Air Force was to, to Panama City, Panama, down just in Panama. So I remember just from being down there, the, the humidity, but I also remember just the, uh, uh, the tropical smell. That was the first thing I really remember was the, the, the humidity, kind of a tropic type of smell, and just the feeling of excitement when I got off the plane and I knew, okay, you're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> you, you're in South America, you're in Paraguay. And there was also that excitement of the reason why we were there. So all of my senses were buzzing. I, I felt like just everything was squirrel, 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 squirrel. So, and for those that may not know, so John Maxwell team had been invited by the president of Paraguay through our friend Gabby who was going to transform Paraguay. The goal was that if we achieve 10% of the population educated on core values and beliefs, that we could transform a country because of the tipping. So 200 and some of us jumped on planes from literally all around the world, descended on Paraguay and began teaching and coaching and guiding, really doing trainer, trainers, training trainers, um, to be able to go out into their communities, their businesses, their places of government and hospitals and really begin to teach values. What was, when you stepped in that classroom for the first moment and you, you pulled out the book and the, if, if you were there, you'll remember we had the little bookmark cards and our little, our little train the trainer kit. Oh. Well, I had the privilege of being with my friend, fellow uh, John Maxwell team member, Jay Johnson. We've, we've known each other yeah. since my last few years of my military days. So we were side by side and, and worked together. And we had made up a plan to, um, to how we would, would start. And I remember walking in that room thinking, okay, I was made for this. And then they told me who was in the room. And there was a little bit of nervousness. I had political leaders in our room. We were in a liberal arts kind of a building. Um, and when we walked in there and said, oh, and the people in the room are the current political party leadership. And I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Talk about being thrown to the wolves right off the bat. I mean, imagine being sent to Washington, D.C. or sent somewhere and they tell you, oh, and by the way, the current Democratic or Republican or whatever leaders are the first people you're you're spending time with and teaching values. It was at first, just kind of like, wow. And then the second moment was, what an opportunity to impact the country right off the bat, hitting right at an area that is so critical, politi the political parties. And from there, it just embraced the moment, jumped in and, and had some fun with them. And, and Christian, Christian Del Rosario, the, our photographer, he showed up there first and got some great pictures and video clips of us in that moment. And some of the pictures I post on my profile are from that moment, actually. Yeah, it's, um, I think back on that, and one of the rooms that I was teaching in were the postal workers. 
And they um, had actually not been paid for, I think, several months because of government shutdowns and strikes and things, but they were still working. And during it, if you remember, we had rain like every day. I mean, you would wake up in the morning and you would see Noah's Ark pass your hotel room um, kind of thing. <laughs> and they had been, a group of them had been relocated by the, out of the, the barrio and into the new apartments down by the river, which were now flooding to the second story. And they still showed up and sat through that class. And I'm thinking, you haven't been paid in months. Your housing is being flooded. Like, I would have come up with a thousand re reasons not to attend another government-led program as we were perceived in certain rooms. And when I stepped into that room and they were so hungry and so engaged and so committed to taking like down every word that I said, man, I was ready to go for another three weeks if they had asked. Yeah, you got that right. And that's great perspective that you brought in because um, I had a group, I had the DAs and the ADAs also. And the lead DA, my translator tells me, oh, I mean, she was, uh, she was about six feet tall. Um, she was wearing this electric blue dress. I love the color blue, so it stood out. And she had these eyes that, and command presence about her. She had that co great combination of command and control at the same time. And uh, my interpreter said, Oh, I recognize her. She's on the radio all the time. and She talks about the really big cases. So she's a well-known personality besides being the, the uh, DA. And she came up to me and the interpreter's there. And she basically said, okay, look, I don't have a lot of um, uh, hope for you guys here, basically. She's saying, I have high <laughs> expectations. Enjoy your hour, and, but don't get yeah. the And I'm thinking, oh, my law and order, dunk, dunk. What am I going to do? <laughs> And when we, but when we got to the end and how engaged they were and everybody was just sharing with each other, she came up to me and she said, you exceeded my expectations. Mm. And it was like, so uh, that was, that was so encouraging. And you shared your story, the Noah's, Noah's Ark, that, oh man, I can remember seeing just stuff flying down the street in front of our hotel when those floods. I, I can't, I can't remember rain like that other than when I was in Panama during rainy season you know, six feet deep um, trenches that would overflow. It, it was, we complain about rain here in San Antonio, you know, because nothing sticks down here when it rains. Oh my, if we got that kind of rain, nobody would be living here. <laughs> so, so when you were, so we all left wherever we left from, the U.S. or from other points, going to wanting to make an impact. And I think it sounds like you were impacted by Paraguay as opposed, I think I got more than I could have ever given during that period. What is it that when you came back, you said, I can't let this go. I can't lose sight of this lesson. This lesson has to hold on after Paraguay. Mm. You know, two things stand out. Um, one of our last nights there, um, I met with, I guess she was in charge of kind of like the, the healthcare administrator for the entire country. Her name's Carolina Aquino. And I was there with um, our folks from Australia. It, 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 it was kind of funny. There were four of us. So it was a Texan and three Australians. It sounded like a, a barroom joke right off the bat. With the <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, were at, we were at the break and Carolina came up to me. And she put her arms on my shoulders and she looked me right in the eye and she said, Dennis, you are an answer to my dream. And that floored me in that moment. And I remember going back to my hotel that night and I locked myself in the bathroom. I bawled my eyes out like a baby that night because, you know, we all dream about making an impact uh, about, you know, Maybe it's being remembered or um, just doing something that has legacy, that our life had meaning. And in that moment, I realized how I had reached that, reached that moment for me significantly to have that impact. And 
it wasn't this big giant, you know, I'm retired Air Force. So, you know, I didn't storm a hill by myself and take, you know, defeat the enemy or anything like that. It was just simply sharing values that uh, honestly Americans take for granted. Um, and, and this individual was seeing her, her countrymen, her, everybody around her being transformed before her very eyes. That, that moment stands out. And then, um, that's the biggest moment that stands out. And then just coming home and seeing that, that impact. There was another lady also when she was sharing in her, her story. You know, for those of you that um, are not sure what we're talking about, we, we did this thing called a roundtable method. And what we did is we had a, a value. The first value that we taught was attitude. And we would bring in a group um, this particular group was a debt collection agency. Now imagine an American yeah. debt collection agency. Yeah, exactly. Imagine that. I mean, high turnover and low morale are the first two things that come to mind for that type of type of business here in the U.S. And this place had, and I was there with Nathan Cook, and this place yeah. had the most incredible. Right. They had the most incredible uh, morale. And the, the, the lady that we were with was the HR manager and took care of everything. She had just a great attitude, great spirit. And we were in the room and we were scoring ourselves on attitude on a scale of one to 10, one meaning oh, awful, 10 being out of this world. And my mind had already said, she's at least an eight. And I looked around the room and everybody had that same view because everybody was excited and sharing with each other. And she said this, she said, I gave myself a four. And everybody in the room, no kidding, the air just went out. You could hear them say, oh, they're like, what? Are you serious? A four? I mean, you could just see it in their eyes. And she said, I gave myself a four because I have a 15-year-old son. And my attitude towards him has been terrible. I'm constantly badgering him. And I need to change. And at that moment, the lights went on and everybody in the room, they realized, oh, wait a minute, this isn't a program to help me just at work. This isn't a program to help me get promoted or more money. This actually I can take home to families. And that was the moment that sealed everything, I think, for me, how the fundamentals, are, all of our complex problems in America and around the world and in our homes all boil down to fundamentals that have gone astray. I, I, you know, we could go on for hours about Paraguay, and I know Melanie Massey and Julie is here. She was a Paraguay visitor as well. Um, if you were in Paraguay, do the thumbs up or I was there too kind of thing. I'd love to see who else is on it. Um, I will, t I went in feeling, you know, completely, I got this. You know, I'm a John Maxwell certified coach and trainer. I travel. Within about 10 minutes of being in the room with these people, I realized how easy life had been for me, how mm -hmm. granted I had taken just getting by. I mean, I joke sometimes now that I live in South America and have traveled so much that it's easy to have faith when you've got credit cards in Walmart because everything can be put on. 30, 60, 90 day payment plan and you can run in the middle of the night and pretty much get duct tape or aspirin and all your problems are solved. And when you go to a place like Paraguay and you saw those buses going by that were so full, people were literally like hanging out the windows just so they could get a ride to work because it was the cheapest form of transportation to get down the street, past the floodwaters and all of that and still showing up so completely completely engaged in each lesson that we were bringing, I, I was like, I, I came back and I said, I got I to gotta start letting go of some of this, this uh, easy life just so I can better understand the values I have. And um, yeah, I, I'll, if Paraguay calls, I'll be on the plane. I'm not doing Costa Rica. I'm in the middle of a uh, big change, but uh, Paraguay calls, I'll be on the plane. So another thing, and then we got to jump to our fun friend Friday envelopes. Um, I know it's like, oh, panic. You do, is it Friday mornings, your steel toe quotes? Uh, Sunday evenings, actually. Sunday evenings, I'm sorry. Um, you know, this was an idea that 
yeah. that just came up, you know, you know, John Maxwell has his, uh, you know, word of the day emails. If, and folks out there, if you don't have just, all you got to do is type in Google, John Maxwell, you know, word of the day, bang, it's there. You know, Darren, Darren Hardy has his Darren Daily. And I love quotes. And I've got, I've got stacks of them. And I've got, you know, they're all over my computer. And they're, they're all over my room. And I thought, you know what? How about I just take a quote of the day, you know, take a quote, share some, share where I found it or how I discovered it and how it impacted me and, and share it in a few minutes and, you know, use hashtag steel toes required. I've been using that hashtag for years. Just one of my friends will post something and I'll say, Ooh, that stepped on my toes. Hashtag steel toes required. <laughs> just stuck. People like it. And I, I've liked it. And, you know, being speakers that we are, you know, I remember hearing preachers, you know, being in church and a man of faith. I can remember a preacher saying, now, listen up. What I'm about to say is about to step on your toes, meaning you're not going to like what I'm about to say or it's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to poke you. It's going to prod you. It's going to get you out of your comfort zone, as we coaches like to say. So um, so I just I just jumped and did it. I, I grabbed a few quotes and said, you know, and I did it on Sundays because Sunday is the recognize first day of the week most people think it's monday because they got to go to work so i figure well let me prime the pump sunday night before you go to bed and you know as you're getting your stuff ready you know most people when they get to that moment you know that we've got too many people that are living that are um surviving monday to friday night to have friday yeah. night to sunday you know mid-afternoon to enjoy and then it's back to the sunday evening and they just do this I got to go back to work again. That's backwards. There's something wrong with that. So I wanted to prime the pump on Sunday before they go to bed, if they watch it live and have something that will get them thinking or inspire them when they wake up in the morning that, okay, you know what? This isn't so bad. Maybe make that little shift. And, and if they don't watch it live, when they wake up Monday morning and see it, maybe they watch it before they go into work. So what I want you guys all to do is send Dennis some of your favorite quotes. Um, it's and so maybe maybe just be his quote of the week on on on, on Steel Toe Sunday. I I am a quote junkie. I mean, I, I wish there was a more organized way for me to keep them. You know, I'll read a book, I'll write it down, I'll steal it. I have no problem stealing quotes and failing to give credit um, sometimes, and what I, I'm like you, it's like sometimes you read it and then you read it and then the third or fourth time it's like, ooh, somebody just dropped that house on me. Now I'm just going to say somebody just stepped on my toes um, because, and especially with John Maxwell material, sometimes he'll say something and because I know his voice in my head, having heard it and read it so much, I'll skim past it and then it almost calls you back to the top of the page like, wait a minute. I didn't read all of that. I just read that. And so I love the idea of having a Sunday quote to sort of guide you through the week. Um, I, I have a good friend um, that one of the things she does for her kids is she has a giant chalkboard at the top of the steps. So all the bedrooms are upstairs and she'll write a quote or a thought or an inspirational idea on the chalkboard and she's got it all framed out and it's all, you know, Pinterest. If you want to see how to do it, I'm sure it's up there. And before her kids engage with anybody else, so before they come downstairs for the breakfast table, get on the bus, go out the door to school or to work, they all get sort of confronted with this mindset reset kind of thing. And she's been doing it since before they could read and now they're all high school and off to college. And when they went off to college, they all got their own blackboard for their dorm rooms, and I thought, how often are we really feeding our brain? Like, you know, we get in the car and out of habit, CNN or the news, whatever comes on, and then we're in work and other people's ideas and thoughts start piling in, that if we don't really get intentional about setting that first seed, there's a lot of weeds that can take over. And so I love the Sunday evening thing. Um, you guys all need to check them out on Sunday evening so you get a good mindset. Absolutely. And it's just fun. I'll interact if somebody posts a question or, you know, they say, hey, you know, I, 
I, I have fun with the folks that, that show up. And I love the idea. That was an idea I was actually going to use was it, for people to send me quotes. And then I'll use their quote, give them a shout out uh, on that particular uh, when I use their quote. So you and I are thinking like brother. Uh oh, trouble. Um, so do you have like a quote that's your, your, your life motto? Or do you have a quote that you're like, you know what? Of all the quotes, this is the one that I hold to closest to. Oh, that's good. That's good. There's two that, that stand out. Uh, the first one actually is John Maxwell's. He said in the, the 15 laws, and I use this at my Air Force retirement ceremony, that it, if you're not doing something with your life, it doesn't matter how long it is. Ooh, that, that if you're not my... doing something, it doesn't matter how long it is. That's right. If, if you're Love just that. floating along nothing I mean what you know what's your purpose it gets to that question and the other is some of the best advice I ever received was from a pastor when I was stationed in England and he said this to me he said the best advice he received was this and he said be ready to pre pray or die at a moment's notice and those are words I the that's right Woo. That, that's kind of almost like a heavy, and uh, I mean, talk about getting a job order. Be ready to <laughs> preach, pray, or die at any moment. I don't know yeah. if I can live. That's, that's pretty heavy. Um, that's pretty scary. Hey. So, <laughs> yes, it's time for the infamous One Friend Friday envelopes. And I want everybody to know that's been watching over the travel week. Oh, my gosh. We found it. It was here on the desk the whole time. We had lost the green clover for two weeks during travel. And everybody thought that maybe I had purposely hidden it because it seemed to be everybody's go-to envelope. But so as I, as I say each week, so we have a bunch of words and cards, intuition, influence, awareness, curiosity, faith. And on uh, Thursday night, sometimes earlier, my son gets to pick cards. He fills the envelopes, and then you get to pick an envelope and do a little teaching for us on it. So this is where the Fun Friend Friday becomes the classroom part. And so we will, you get a choice of a pink heart, um, oops, a orange star, rainbow. I just dropped, there we go, let me do this. Sorry, I'm out of my element today. Yellow moon, um, blue diamond, Red balloon and green clover. These are, yes, the Lucky Charm cereal that we grew up and loved. I don't know if you were like me, but I hated the marshmallow thing. That was just nasty. But, yeah. you know, we all picked out the marshmallows now and, and used them. So, <laughs> which one will it be? Orange star, rainbow, red balloon, blue diamond, pink heart, yellow moon, or green clover? Let's go with the yellow moon. That's what popped in my head as you were going through them. So I want to follow my intuition and go with yellow moon. So I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows what's in it. And in the tra tradition, oh, this is good. And in the tradition of Steve Harvey, we reveal the envelope where everybody can see it. And so the word is, I know it's backwards, it's respect. Respect. Wow. You know, you know that quote, be ready to preach prayer, die at a moment's notice. This is how I apply that, to the, being ready to speak at a moment's notice, impromptu and, and having fun. So that, that's one of the applications of, of that particular verse. You don't have to take that to its literal uh, meaning. So here we got respect. You know, we were just talking about old songs, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Everybody wants to be respected. <laughs> and that's And you know what? The biggest, um, my, my Popeye, uh, that's all I can stands, I can't stands no more, is when I'm disrespected. I can't stand to be disrespected. I can take almost anything else, but being disrespected is, uh, I won't tolerate that. Um, so respect is huge. Think of it from a leadership perspective. If you don't respect your leader. If you walk in and, and you, you know, they're not a person of character, 
they they are they are the do as I say, not as I do type of leadership, where they will never um, lend a hand or, or or be involved in any of the projects that they give you, and they've got the been there done that mindset. Or if you've seen the movie Band of Brothers, there's a lieutenant in there who constantly, when everybody else is getting shot with mortar, when something comes up and it's a tough question, he walks away. And he had the reputation for being, he had a reputation where he was not respected by anybody. And his senior non-commissioned officer had to work desperately to ensure that the unit maintained their, their bearing, they maintained their discipline, and at the same time gave the lieutenant the respect he earned due to his rank, not the person. And I, I tell you, re respect, what does that look like? What does that look like to you? It could be with your kids. It could be as simple as a yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, sir. I'm in the South. Thank you and please are respectful. If you're at work, it's do not only showing up, it's showing up. It's doing the job. When the boss asks you to do something, you may not understand it, and you may not agree with it, and you may not even see the big picture on why you do it. But if you're an employee, you do it because that's your leader, and they ask. That's part so of I, your job. I think one of the points that you bring out is that so often, especially in companies, we try and have this culture of respect. And as Dave McClellan, uh, is a, as in his modeling of working with corporations, it's really, it has to be a behavior. And, you know, when you say that, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, in the South, now some people from the North or outside of that would feel like, what? That's offensive. But as somebody who grew up in Minnesota, lived in Georgia, I heard that and I had the same reaction. Now raising my son, I'm asking for that yes or no, sir. Not because I want to be, you know, mean and stern and captain, but I simply want the acknowledgement that what I said was heard. And then with that yes, sir, I can then evaluate the behavior that follows it to determine the level of respect. So the yes, sir, isn't the respect. It's that behavior that he does after he acknowledges receipt of the, the instruction, so to speak. And so I love how you, you said that, you know, in the military, there is positional leadership. He is there because we have trusted his decision-making process. And that statement of yes, sir, is simply, I will trust his decision and act accordingly. Exactly. And when, when I think of respect also, it's when you give it, you get it. You receive it. Isn't that true? I mean, if a person, and it can be as simple as eye contact, it can be the tone and the way you say yes, sir, no, sir. There are many times when, when I have said to my parents, yes, sir, and I was saying the words, but on the inside, I was, you know, I, I was saying deep down inside how, you know, I was angry or fuming or whatever. I, I think it's like uh, I've heard the story of the kid told to go stand in the corner. And he said, well, I might be standing in the corner, but I'm sitting down on the inside. You know, <laughs> fact isn't just an action. It's, it's internalized. And people can tell by your energy. They can tell by the way you say things. They can tell by the way that you look at them whether you truly respect them or not. It goes to John's principle. If you treat people with a 10 over their head, how are they going to respond? They're going to respond in a different way than if you gave them a two. So, so respect from the external. So turning it inward, because you as a coach mm -hmm. and a speaker often encounter people, and you had ex expressed it in Uruguay or in Paraguay, that you had met people that didn't understand that respect of self or that honoring of self. How do you help somebody that just says, you know what? It, the, and I say when I don't see people respecting themselves, they give up on their dreams, they give up on their finances, their life begins to just disintegrate from them. How can you find that respect again for self? Because as you said, if you don't have it for you, you can't give it to others and others can't give it back to you. 
How do you complete that circle? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I have, as I'm thinking through it, um, I would talk with the individual to, to find out those moments where where they where they received you know maybe it's an affirmation sometimes we we for our respect sometimes when we get that affirmation especially self worth self respect when somebody praises you for something it could be as simple as you know going back to elementary school and you got six gold stars for spelling all of your words right um, if you're athletic, maybe you won an event at your at your kit in field day or hit a game winning basket in basketball. Go back to a sporting event that where you you did something well, even if it's as simple as making starting team at some point or making the varsity team where you had to work hard and that and then take it to that moment when the coach said, announce your name on the varsity team or announce your name in the starting five in basketball, or um, you competed in something and you won, or you gave it your best and you came in second and you weren't even expected to place. So I, I go back to my eighth grade and I was goof off in, in school. I was a class clown. I mean, I was one of those kids that I rose to the level of expectation of my teachers. So the teachers that pushed me, I excelled. And for the teachers, because I was a goof off, thought, you know, this kid's not going to do anything. I lived up to their expectation in class. And I remember um, my grades were awful in my history class. I was just lazy. Honestly, I was lazy. But I remember <laughs> my, parents, uh, my parents said, hey, you're in danger of failing. And if you fail, you're in trouble. But if you pass, we're going to give you 50 bucks. Now, guys, 50 bucks doesn't sound like a lot. But to a 13-year-old in the 80s, 50 bucks was a mint. That's like me. a couple dozen days. Exactly. And so what I did is I studied. I did something new for the first time. I studied. <laughs> I wasn't relying on talent or memory. I actually studied. And when we did, after this test, um, our grades came back. I had the highest grade in the class. I got a 99. And all the smart kids in the class were upset. My teacher, when she looked at it, almost had a heart attack. And my parents, they said, don't let this happen again. <laughs> but I remember the moment because I was validated and respected myself that, you know what, I can study and I can do this and I'm smarter. And so, you know, here I am now, I'm in my 40s. And I remember something when I was 13 year old, 13 years old, because it was one of those aha moments of respecting myself and giving myself better opportunities down the road and knew I could do it. So well, I, I do think that. That's a, I love that lesson because sometimes we're in a season that it's hard to see out of, that we're going through a change. We're going through a period that it's really difficult to see sort of up and over the edge of where we're at, that maybe we do need to go to that third grade, that you know, sixth grade or, you know, back at the time, because what gave you the moment of credibility, of respect in the past is part of your DNA. And that doesn't disintegrate or go away. The situation around you may feel as if you've lost it. But the reality is, as you said, it lives in me. I know that if I apply myself and it's important enough, I can not exceed my expectations, but everything around me come out on top. And being able to do that then you can turn and look at the other guy that maybe is performing below the waterline and go, wait a minute, he might be in the same spot I was back the day before that history test. How do I motivate? How do I show him? How do I encourage him to step fully into what his potential is? And that's, I love that because you, you, you show the cycle of first, when we can learn to respect ourselves both in the dark and in the light, then we can look at others and go, you know what, maybe you're not in your best light right now, but I'm still going to put that 10 over your head. I'm going to show you respect. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to be integrous with my respect to you. Um, I know in our political climate right now, it's so easy to just bash, bash, bash against the wall and, and throw mud and talk negative and just, you know, be disrespectful. And 
my mother raised me that you honor the position, you don't have to like the person. And that not only plays out in our politics, but I think in our offices sometimes. It's like, you know what, I don't have to like you, the shirt you're wearing, the food you eat, whatever. But because you're in a position of learning, I need to give you the respect until that is removed through your actions or your position. So I really like that idea. I like that respect came from you. And I think it's most appropriate that came from um, one of our service members in the Air Force, because I know you guys have sort of such a, you have, my brother-in-law was Air Force. Um, and so you guys have such a high standard for, you know, we got Dr. Holly Kelly and anytime she goes up, I got to tuck my shirt to make sure it's Marine tight. Um, got to check my hair with the Air Force to make sure it's combed high. So I don't know, Army, I guess I just got to make sure my shoe's tied, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of Army friends. They're going to love that. <laughs> uh, well, I, I knew you would relate to that. But, yeah. there, there are, I, I love our service men and women because there's such, you know, such uh, rivalry and at the same moment, such support for each other. And so it's kind of like a unit of big brothers that always pick on each other. But when the family's called in to act, you don't want to go against them no matter which group they're in. So uh, first, let me thank you for your service and traveling and the hardship that I know I've caused both you and your family during that and you sticking with um, Total honor. It's one of those lessons that Diane, and I see she's here, I thought of, again, being in the airport, and we see so many servicemen and women traveling, especially for me because of where I'm at, and I know that they're either getting deployed or coming back from a deployment, and they're trying to get through the airport to get home, and they're in uniform because they're still actively in duty while they're in uniform, and they just want to get home from their family or they're leaving their family for, you know, for an extended period that, I got to tell you, just, oh, thanks. I, mean, I was so to watch when I came through an airport, the ticket person take a very moment and very intentional and hold the ticket in the hand before they released it and thank that service member. And that was showing respect in a way that it wasn't just, hey, thanks for your service. I've been trained to say this. He held the ticket in a way that the man couldn't take it back until they had finished that moment of acknowledgement and respect to give it. And so I think it's a great word. What I love challenge everybody to do is really like check yourself on are you being first respectful to self and then I always start with family how are you respecting your family are you putting them first or last but where today could you go out and say you know what I need to up my level of, of respect I gotta start putting some tens on top of people's head instead of trying to move them from an eight to a seven to a six to a five to a four so I can put some something up on Facebook tonight and complain about the world around me Oh, that's so good. And another thought that came to my mind on respect is, you know, we wonder how do we practice, um, you know, how do you practice building character? I mean, how do you measure that? Well, you know, in order to exercise those, what I call, I'm a man of faith. So I, I'm, I'm thinking of these things called the fruit, fruit of the spirit. And everybody always says, you know, I pray God for patience. Well, in order to exercise that muscle, it's got to be put in positions to be exercised. So, you know, there are times when you pray for patience and you're dealing with a very rude, disrespectful person. There you go. There's that opportunity to practice that patience. And I find that respect is linked to all of, all of those areas. Um, I had to train an individual one time. Um, she was a civilian, older didn't really work with computers and databases at all. And, you know, it was, it's still, still relatively fresh, some of these databases we had to work with in the Air Force. And it was my job not only to learn the database, but then I, I had to train her. And I can still remember to this day, every day, hearing these words, Dennis, can you help me, please? And I would go over and I would spend time with her and and talk her through it. I would talk her through the same things probably a couple of times a week. But you know what? That, that patience paid off and being respectful to her, being older than I am and learning something new, it took her literally, it took her literally a year and a half to really get comfortable with that database 
but she took it over and owned it until she retired from uh, civil service. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm glad this word came up because I think, yeah, it's very obvious that we've sort of let respect go because we've developed a culture of like, well, me first and I don't have to. And, you know, we've sort of, you know, I grew up in a very disciplined family and, you know, you held the door, you waited until everybody was seated before you started eating. Just the basic manners. And somewhere we got in this idea that opening a door for a lady was sexist or standing on one side of the street versus the other was disrespectful or, you know, all of this that, you know, this trying to neutralize and not be politically incorrect. And so somehow that sucked respect out of our culture at the same time that, you know, my, in our home, we have behaviors that we do that show respect to the other person, opening doors, waiting, you know, please and thank you, yes sir, no sir. And I think we really have an obligation as parents and as leaders and in influences to start practicing those behaviors of respect, even on the smallest scale of opening the door, saying thank you. Because you're right, we've let respect become something we say for formal job interviews. And in our day-to-day -day life, I think we just let it flow down by. That's so good. And, and again, it goes back to fundamentals. These are fundamental principles that if we apply them every day and build on them, we're not going to have the complex problems that we have due to fundamental errors. We can get into problem solving and making things better instead of going back to the basics and rebuilding off of that foundation. We should be building off of that every day and growing. It feels like it feels like that, many times. Go ahead. I was gonna say that's a. I mean, y'all got to catch that. We wouldn't have complex problems if we focused on fundamental behaviors. Absolutely, it, we're we're constantly. Are are we gonna have? Are we gonna mess up? Oh, absolutely. I mean, mess up every day. But there are areas. <laughs> Fundamentally, we should never mess up. And respect is one of them. If we can get the respect thing down, that will be a huge improvement in attitude and a whole lot of other areas that are connected because of respect. I, 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 the fallout of family values has been a huge contributor to the loss of respect. Ah, amen, Diana. I know Diane comes from the Midwestern kind of mindset as well um and it's funny because my kids rally against it because they're kids and they're like what do you mean she could open the door for herself <laughs> and i'm like no sorry you're the brother she's the girl you're a boy this is training ground when i drop them off at school her door gets open because i want her to understand that shows not only love but respect and that i want her to start looking at the other men that here in her life in 20 and 30 years i don't want her dating too soon um, and going, wait a minute, you didn't open the door. My dad always opens the door for me, loves me. And if you don't open the door, does that then equate to a lack of love and respect? So I think it's, I, I love that this word came up. I'm going to be stuck on this for the rest of the week. Um, I, I, that's what I love for on Friday, because when Becky told me about divine appointments, and I started looking out my life for divine appointments, and now you've made me stop and think about respect and asking myself, wait a minute, how, what is my, how, how into the game am I playing? Am I just, you know, bouncing it off at a one or a two? Am I willing to commit to diving deeper and growing more in the way I display respect and live respect and, and honor people through respect? So the cards knew best the lesson I needed to learn today, and I thank you for bringing it to me. Oh, a pleasure. And you know, one of the best compliments ever given to me is when somebody says, you know what, you're such a gentleman. That's a, that's a great compliment because, you know, I, you, we were talking about TV shows. I, I start thinking about guys like Dick Van Dyke or Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, Air Force guy. And some in their man, how they
honored the people in their shows or even, you know, Leave it to Beaver. There's another one. I love Leave it to Beaver. Uh, growing up, I loved that family. I thought that was the typical American family when I was a kid, you know? And, but they were gentlemen. And there's just something about that, that you mentioned the word honor. And I love that word. I love that word honor because I, I want to be known as, as a man of honor care and, and, and a gentleman. I've known as that. And so, um, and, uh, I, I love it. Yeah, I'm going to be, not only do we have the Golden Girls, but I think we have to go listen to the Andy Griffin theme song type of thing. Um, you know, he, he amplified respect with the, being the sheriff and always being of service. I, I see, last week we had, we had technology and confusion issues, but I think this lesson was timely and, as Melanie Massey said, a divine appointment lesson for us. And so I thank you for being here with me today. I'm going to encourage you guys all to send over your best quote, your, 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 your life quote, if you have one, to Dennis, so he can add it to his Sunday Steel Toe Quote um, uh, webinar, or Facebook Live, I'm sorry. Um, you, are you doing any classes soon, online virtual classes soon? You know... That's an area of growth for me this year. So far, since I've been a coach, um, I have not done any online or, or teleconferencing masterminds or anything like that. That's an area I'm growing this year. So I don't have one scheduled right now today. However, I will be. And, um, and I'm not sure of the topic yet, but I oh. on personal growth because I love, uh, I love spending time with people uh, especially dealing with personal growth. I like to be the cult when you're, I, I've had this happen to me many times in my air force career. I get up in the morning, I get in the shower. I'm ready for a hot shower to get ready, get into work. And it's ice cold. <laughs> I want to be, I, I want to be that ice cold wake up shower for people to get them going and growing and moving forward into their purpose and calling. I, I, so, I, I, I personal growth on your schedule i hear it coming up the 15 laws absolutely it's my it's my favorite that's my go-to if you were to cut me that that i i bleed a little bit of green from the cover of that book yes i i tell everybody that asks me what one book should they buy of john maxwell's and i know john probably would prefer i say his latest book so it can stay on the bestsellers list but I always do, you know what? You could live off 15 laws for the rest of your life. If you got to the end, took a day off, and then started back at the front, you would never learn, run out of lessons. And so, yeah, it is, it is my go-to, it's my go-to book, it's my go-to class. When, it's, when somebody says, what should I start learning? I'm like, if you can master the 15 laws, and I mean master, then there's nothing you can't do. So maybe that's your teaching. Um, let's see what the, uh, I see and believe that new day. Yeah. That, so we got Melanie Massey here. It's going to be a fun friend Friday coming up. She was in Paraguay. I don't know if Diane was, um, I'll have to check with her, but I want to thank you again. And I got to do our, our theme music, you know, on the way out. I want to thank you again for being a friend on fun friend Friday. I so appreciate you. Um, everybody take a moment and check out the Sundays. Um, I, I was scrolling through them and I started like, oh, I got to write this one down and write this one down. So I think one of the other things we need you to do as a courtesy, courtesy to us is at least start to write them out in a way that we can start copying them and carrying them with us through the week. To, you know, because you teach on it and then like, I don't know if other people have this issue, but you'll teach on it and then I'll walk away and I'm like, my neck will snap, sort of that whiplash thing like, wait a minute, there's more meat on that bone I still need to dig off. So I love having that from you on Sundays. Uh, I appreciate that. And you read my mind again. I'm actually, um, I'm going to start transcribing all of those and uh, look, f I'm going to use that as a book. I actually have decided that as I'm growing this, it's going to be kind of like a devotional book that, that I'm producing. So that, that's a, a level of awareness I, I received in the last two weeks. So 
that's probably a project for 2019, but for now, just accumulating them and come together. But I appreciate that feedback. I'll, I'll definitely make sure that that quote is, after I've shared it, I'll repost it in the notes so everybody has the actual quote and they can just copy and paste rather than write it down. <laughs> I appreciate you. And thank you again so much for joining me on Fun Friend Friday. Thank you, everybody else, for joining. Make sure you share this out so everybody gets to know my good friend Dennis and get to know about his Sunday Steel Pilda episodes. And again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for the lesson today on respect. You've lay, raised my level of awareness. And so now you've challenged me to um, tighten up my show and get, get a little more respectful for those people around me. Start putting tens back on top of people's heads. Oh, I, I appreciate you, Eric. Thank you. I love what you do. I love how you coach and really ask great questions of people and really dive in until you get them to that point where they get to that level of awareness. And I love the show. And keep doing what you're doing. And I, this word was timely because, you know, we had the, the issues last week. I appreciate you, and I thank you for allowing me to, to, uh, to join you this week. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. See you guys next Monday, 8 a.m. Eastern, or next Monday, Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern. And then we got Fun Friend Fridays at 8 as well. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.